Good evening, everyone. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for a beautiful day. And thank you that we could freely gather to worship you and hear from you as we study your word. And Father, we just pray that these lessons here in Joshua would minister to our hearts and draw us close to you. We love you, Lord, and we want to honor you with these songs this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 7 as we continue our study through the Word of God. At this point, the children of Israel are in the Promised Land, the land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now, from their base camp in Gilgal, they've gone out and defeated the first en enemy, the Amorites in the city of Jericho. And it was a great victory. Jericho was a strong fortress, and man, when they saw what God had done tearing those, bringing those walls down and they defeated the enemy, I'm sure they're excited about this victory. But keep in mind, the battles are just beginning. Uh, you know, as great as a victory this was, they have many more battles. In fact, seven years of battles they're going to face. And this is only one, so they've got a long, long time to go. And the next battle they're going to face are the people of Ai. And it literally means heap. It was a small town compared to Jericho, about 10 miles northwest of Jericho. And why they went to Ai next is because if he defeated Ai, the children of Israel would have control of the ridge route that ran north to south along the central highlands. And so this was another strategically located city for the nation of Israel to defeat as they made their conquests then to the south and to the north. So as we begin our study this evening, let me start with these words from Joshua 6.27 as that chapter closed and this is what we are told. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout all the country. So that's where we're going to pick up this evening in John chap or John, Joshua chapter 7, uh, starting in verse 1, as the children of Israel destroyed Jericho, and they're excited, they're on a high, and their fame is spreading. And let's see what the Lord has for us this evening. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. I want you to notice something here that I think is important as we read the scriptures. When a chapter opens up or a verse opens up with the word but speaking about us, that's a bad thing. When it speaks about God, but God, it's usually a good thing, but not for us. And the problem here is simple. Achan took some of the spoils of their victory in Jericho when Joshua told them back in Joshua 6, verses 18 and 19, And you by all means abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold, the vessels of bronze and iron, are consecrated to the Lord. They, they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So this first victory or the first fruits of these battles were to be given to the Lord. And Achan, by his actions, stole really from the Lord. Why? What motivated him? Well, selfishness, you know, you always want something that's not yours. And yeah, you know, Philip Keller offers some insight into how Achan could have rationalized his actions. And it's so easy for us to do this. We rationalize things. But this is what he wrote. After all, was he not a man of war? Had he not risked his life in crossing the Jordan? Was he not entitled to the spoils of war now that the city of Jericho had fallen? Didn't tradition dictate that booty or spoil was the reward of battle? Why should he necessarily capitulate to Joshua's command about common people avoiding the accursed belongings of the Amorites? So yeah, that's what Achan was doing. He was rationalizing this. And you think, well, is it such a big deal? Yeah, because the way the Lord feels about this, it is a huge deal. It's not going to affect just Achan, but the nation as a whole. R Wesley Hunt put it like this. He said, sin causes the loss of God's power and presence. Sin shuts off the showers of God's blessings. 
Sin stifles and strangles the abundant life promised in Christ. Sin paralyzes and, mo and immobilizes the life of the individual believer and the local body. God's message to Joshua applies also to God's people today in times of obvious spiritual defeat and decline, namely, deal with sin. Yeah, and I realize some may not feel this way, but sin not only affects the person who's doing it, but it happens to those around them. In fact, for Achan, it affected the entire nation. What about today? Well, I mean, think about it. It's simple. You know, look at alcoholism, adultery, drug, drug abuse, and so on. It doesn't just affect the person involved in it. It affects their family. It affects their friends. It's widespread, and that's what sin does. And, you know, it's interesting because we've seen and will see that the Canaanites couldn't defeat the children of Israel. Well, the children of Israel could defeat themselves by quenching the work of God, by quenching the Holy Spirit in their lives. They're going to alienate themselves from God's plan and power. And isn't that true in the battles we face? We're defeated when we turn from God, when we try to do it our way, when we rationalize things and think, well, this is okay for me to do. You know, King Solomon is a good example of that. You know, God had already told uh, the nation of Israel what kings were supposed to do. You know, not multiply wives, not multiply riches, not go down to Egypt for horses. And Solomon did it all. You think, well, how could he? He's the wisest man in the world. God even says it in his word. Because he believed, and I, I think this is the way he saw it. This is for you guys, not for me. Because I'm the wisest man in the world. So this can't apply to me. I can handle it. You can't. And he found out he couldn't. And it hurt him with his walk with God. Well, look at verse 2. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So, again, Great victory at Jericho, a lot of pride in their lives, and I think they're really self-confident. And Joshua says, hey, you know what? Let's send some spies into Ai. Find out how we can get in there, get some battle plans. This city is very small compared to Jericho. This should be easy. In fact, that's what the spy said. Why weary everyone when this is such an easy battle, basically? That's a purely fleshly outlook on this situation. Do you see any mention of Joshua praying, seeking God's direction in this battle? No. And it's not a good thing. Now, Paul in Galatians 3.3 3 said, Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Are you going to do it in your own power, under your own strength? Or are you going to rely on God? One writer said this, he said, this was the first time in the conquest that jo Joshua did anything on his own initiative, and it was doomed to failure. It is ominous that nothing is said about Joshua seeking guidance from the Lord. The great victory at Jericho made him overly confident of God's help. Yeah, he didn't go to the Lord for this one. And we have to keep in mind that yesterday's victory does not make a believer immune to being defeated today. And isn't it the small things that usually get us? You know, the big things we pray about, because they're huge things, and they're like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? But it's the small things that we don't even think about asking God or seeking direction from God. And we try to accomplish in the flesh what needs to be done in the spirit. We have to continually, in all things, depend on the Lord. You know, Paul, in Ephesians 6.10, said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Yeah, not my might, but in the Lord's. We need to remember that. And we have to remember when we gain some victory over sin or some problem in our life, when God gives us that victory, we can easily take credit for it. We think, hey, look, I'm strong. I've done this. Man, it's not going to be an issue anymore. And that pride will bring you down. It's dangerous. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall, yeah. You know, 
Alan Redpath said there is no moment so perilous as when, for the first time in his Christian life, the man of God has experienced deliverance from sin. At such times, we begin to take pride in ourselves and to boast that our own arm has saved us. We easily imagine that because we have achieved victory once, God has imparted to us some new strength which will see us through all our earthly journey. Alas, how utterly contradictory to the truth that is. The fact is that, apart from the grace of God and the blood of Jesus, the smallest temptations will be too powerful for us. The victories we win in fellowship with the risen Christ impart no strength to us. The victory you won yesterday will not bring you power today. The greatest lesson that the child of God has to learn is the lesson learned by Paul, that in my flesh dwells no good thing, and that when I am weak, then I am strong. For the greatest cause of failure in Christian living is just this. Imagining that victory God has given us has imparted strength to us to win every battle when it has not done nothing of the kind. Remember, fellow Christian, the first reason for failure at AI was self-confidence. Yeah, and we're going to see that. Look at verse 4. So about 3,000 men went up from there, from, there from, from the people, but they fled before the men of AI. And the men of AI struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shabarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Wow. What if they didn't send just 3,000 men? What if Joshua sent in 100,000 men against this small city? Would they have won? Absolutely not. Why? Because they were sitting in the camp. God wasn't going to give them the victory. It didn't matter how many men they sent in. It didn't matter if Ai had one man or a thousand men. Israel was not going to get this victory. And really, this is not a victory for Ai. This is a defeat for the children of Israel because they weren't walking with God. And, you know, we see 3,000 men enter in this battle, right? 2,964 come home in defeat. They lost 36 men in this battle, 36 lives, 36 more than died at Jericho. Because in the battle of Jericho, with this bigger city, fortress of a city, they were stronger. They didn't lose anyone. Isn't that interesting? Not one. But they didn't take this battle seriously. And from a military standpoint, you think, well, 36 men, that's not too bad. But 36 men could have been saved, and the children of Israel could have been victorious if they sought the Lord in this matter. You see, the sin of one person had consequences on the innocent, and because Joshua didn't seek the Lord, they were defeated. You know, think about it. When God is with us, Jericho is not too strong to be captured. When he is driven from us by our own sin, Ai is not too weak to defeat us. Yeah. And now there's fear growing in the camp of Israel. Man, if we can't defeat this little hick town of Ai, how are we going to win all these other battles? With the enemy is bigger and stronger, we're not going to be able to do it. And apart from the Lord, they're not going to be able to do it. You know, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You're not going to accomplish anything, and we need to understand that. It's not by my might nor my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. As we read in Zerubbabel, or Zechariah, excuse me, 4, 6, as the Lord spoke to Zerubbabel about rebuilding the temple. It's by his spirit empowering us. Well, verse 6, Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening, both he and and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? To deliver us into the hand of the Amorites? To destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. O oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? So Joshua is mourning not only for these 36 men, but for the nation as a whole since they lost this battle. We've had it. We're in trouble. And who is he blaming in all this? 
God, it's your fault. Wow. He tells the Lord, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? To destroy us? It sounds like the children of Israel when they were during their wilderness wanderings, right? Wow. And the problem wasn't with the Lord, but the sin in the camp that wasn't dealt with. God didn't bring them in the promised land to destroy them, but when a person is in sin, they tend to blame God for their problems, and that's what we see. Secondly, what shall I say now that Israel has turned to flee before their enemies? He's speechless. He doesn't know what to do since Israel was defeated. What about prayer? What about seeking God, seeking direction from him instead of blaming God? That's what he needed to do. Thirdly, then what will you do for your great name? Wow, that's a lot of chutzpah. Lord, what are you going to do for your reputation? How are you going to handle this? How are you going to deal with this? How are you going to get out of this jam? I don't know if I want to talk with God like that. That's not a good thing. What are you going to be able to do about this? God said he, that they would give, he would give them these victories. And what Joshua is saying, you failed. We, this little town of Ai, we couldn't even destroy. And once word gets out, all the enemies are going to come down upon us and wipe us out. We're going to be powerless to stop them. And what are you going to do about it? You know, if you're blaming God, you have the wrong perspective of the situation. We need to do heart checks on ourselves because it's not his fault, as we're going to see. Look at, at how verse 10 opens up. So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up! Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived, and they also have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. And you read that and go, man, that's pretty harsh, huh? And God goes, get up. What are you doing on the floor like that? How in the world could Joshua have known that there was sin in the camp? See, that's what our minds would go to. How could he have known? How could he know, have known that it was Achan who took the spoils of the victory at Jericho? Because he could have prayed. And he didn't seek direction. If he would have sought direction, Lord, what do you want us to do in this battle at Ai? The Lord would have said, you needed to deal with sin in the camp. But this was a little hick town. You know, you don't need a lot of men to go in there. We got this battle. It's easy. And he, it wasn't. And God says, you need to get up. You need to do a heart check, Joshua. You need to face these issues that are before you because there's sin in the camp. You know, this defeat at Ai was not God's fault. It was their own. And God says, I'm not going to help you until you remove the accursed things from among you. You know, sin, again, affects us and it affects those around us. Remember in the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 5, you know, Paul speaks of uh, sin affecting those around the sinner. He said, it's actually reported that there is sexual, sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in the body but present in the spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? What was going on in Corinth? Pride. Look, we welcome everyone. We don't judge anybody's sin. And we welcome this guy. In fact, the Greek word for sexual immorality immorality is pornea and it's any kind of sexual extramarital sexual act and this was not a one-night stand with his stepmom 
as wrong as that was. This was an affair that continued on and on, and the church was aware about it and aware of it and didn't do anything about it. And it, what's interesting is that the pagans, the Roman law, forbid this kind of sexual activity. They were open to all kinds of stuff, right? But they're like, this is over the line. And yet the church of Corinth goes, oh no, we're, you know, look how loving we are. Paul calls them on it. They were proud of, of their tolerance. But so, Paul says, hey, you know what? You need to deal with this issue. Now, I realize, you know, you start coming against sin and people right away go to Matthew 7. Oh, brother, judge not that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And it's, what, is, what do they use that for? To justify their sin. Don't judge me. And God's going to judge you, man. Well, first of all, make sure you come with the right heart before you come before someone. You know, you, it, the whole idea is restoration, not their destruction. Um, secondly, we, we can't judge their motives, um, but their conduct, yeah. We're to keep each other accountable. And when sin is seen, it needs to be dealt with. And false doctrine is easy, right? You know, it, if it doesn't line up with the word of God, get rid of it. And Paul tells them, here's how you handle this. Kick the guy out of the church. You know, today they would just go down the road to the next church. They, in Corinth, they couldn't do that, right? Why did he say kick him out of the church? To let Satan buffet him. Let Satan beat him up. You see, there's a protection within the body of Christ. Now he's out there on his own, and it's kind of like, you know, I've seen the National Geographic uh, graphic with the antelope out there, and, you know, everyone, all the antelopes are in a herd, and there's always that one that's going do 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 not paying attention, and the lion, you know, you know what happens. And Satan is a roaring lion, and he looks for those that he can attack. And Paul says, with the hope that he repents and gets right, and then let him back in the church. And we see in 2 Corinthians, he did repent. He did get right, and he came back into the church. You know, it's interesting Paul doesn't rebuke the woman because the woman, I don't believe, was saved. So this wasn't an issue for her. She needed to get saved. But he does rebuke the man because I think he was a believer. And Paul says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Yeah, it affects everyone. And if sin is not dealt with, it's kind of like a, ignoring a tumor in your body. If it's it's going to grow and grow, and it'll finally destroy you, consume you. And that's what was going on in Corinth, and that's what's happening in the camp of Israel. And God says, you need to deal with this, Joshua. Look at verse 13. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourself for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in your midst. O oh, Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to the families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. So here's the solution. Consecrate yourself, set yourself apart unto the Lord. And Joshua doesn't know who the offender is, but God does, right? And he's going to expose the sinner. It's interesting because we see Paul speak of this in Hebrews 4.13, that there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Yeah. Also, he's going to be burned with fire. Sin needed to be dealt with or the nation wouldn't be blessed. And again, the Lord could have shown this to Joshua before the battle of Ai if Joshua had sought direction from the Lord, but he didn't. And for us as Christians, make no mistake about it, our position before God is secure in Jesus. I don't think you can lose your salvation as a Christian because it's a free gift given to us by Christ. And the work that Christ started in us, Paul said in Philippians, he's going to finish. 
And I think the real issue, though, with sin is our fellowship with God, and that can be broken because of sin. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, Paul said, Do not quench the Spirit. You see, by disobeying the Lord, rejecting what he's telling you to do or not do, you can quench the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's like throwing water on fire. It'll quench it. 1 John 1, 1.9, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I think John is speaking of our fellowship with God, the sanctification process. You know, practically speaking, yes, we still sin. And sin breaks our fellowship with God. It can keep us away from him. Positionally, our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west to be remembered no more. And, you know, it says Proverbs 28, 13 through 14 says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Yeah. You know, you look at the kings of Judah and Israel, and we see what happens as they harden their hearts to God. They ignored their sin. They kept moving farther and farther and farther away from God. Why? Because the light exposes their darkness. They didn't want that light of God in their lives anymore, and they were more interested in the pagan religious activities than what God had called them to do. But, you know, God is so gracious so merciful. He says, if we confess our sins before him, that fellowship won't be hindered. You know, the Greek word for confess literally means that we are to say the same thing or to agree with God. That just makes sense. We're in agreement with him. He hates sin. He wants us to do what's right. And the problem comes when we don't agree with God. And I'll tell you what, God's never wrong. So, it's our issue that we have to deal with, and that fellowship can be broken. But you come before God and confess your sin, he forgives you. And I love that about our God. Well, look at verse 16. Look at how this plays out here. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of the Zerahites, and he brought the family of the Zerorites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Can you imagine what was going through Achan? As they picked Judah, uh-oh, that's my tribe. And they keep picking, and it's getting closer, and then all of a sudden, you to man, Achan. Come forward, son. Wow. You know, I'm sure he thought, man, this is awesome for a time, right? I've got all these riches. But how quickly it came to an end. And that's what's in, what, what happens when we get involved in sin. It ends, that joy we had is, ends up going away very quickly. And I'm sure he tried to justify his actions. And I deserve the spoil of victory. I fought in the battle and so on. But now he's nervous. They found him out. And fear, I bet, overwhelmed him. And I wonder if he thinks now, was it all worth it? I don't think so. Can you imagine, one writer said, what Aiken is going through at this moment. Sweat is streaming down his forehead. His palms are clammy. It's getting stuffy, and he's outside. His knees are starting to knock. Judgment is closing in. Why in the world does Achan not confess and throw himself on God's mercies? But that's the problem with sin. It causes you to hide and cover up and believe you're the exception. Sin is delusional. You start to think you'll be the first person in the history of the world to get away with it. Yeah, it's not going to happen. And we're going to look at this. You know, Achan really doesn't repent of his sin, as we're going to see. Look at verse 19. So Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them, and there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. 
Look at how long it took him to confess. And he waited till his sin was exposed. And I don't think it was a heartfelt one. I don't think he, I think, he, hey, I'm caught. I mean, how do I get out of this? There's no way. I, I, I don't think he was truly sorry. Hey, man, yeah, I did this. You can go check it out in my tent. He had a choice. He could have repented and got right with God. Oh, Lord, forgive me. You now, Paul in 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 through 10 said, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. It's, I'm sorry I got caught. You know, prisons are filled with people. I'm sorry I got caught but not true repentance before the Lord. Now, what's interesting is this Babylonian garment was probably the robe of the king of Jericho. It's the same word used in uh, Jonah 3.6 to express the royal robe of the king of Nineveh, um, which he laid aside as he humbled himself before God. So here he is. He's got the royal robe, the kingly robe. He's got all this silver, gold. Wow. Do you see what happened here? Verse 21 of Joshua 7, I saw, I coveted, and I took. You know, 1 John tells us that very thing. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, I saw. The lust of the eyes, I coveted. And the pride of life, life I took is not from the Father, but is of the world. And that's, that's how sin progresses. James says in James 1, verses 14 and 15, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Yeah, don't play with those thoughts. Confess them, get rid of them. Verse 22. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent. And there it was, hidden in his tent, with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. Here's the thing, and this is where people struggle. We can understand Achan, why he was put to death for a sin, but what about his family? Some say the family of Achan was an accomplice to this crime. They knew about it, and thus they were guilty. I don't think that's what's going on here if you read this, these verses. Um, I, I don't think, I think it was just Achan that was uh, stoned and burned. And the reason I say that is if you look at verses 25 and 26 of Joshua 7, it says, you, you, him, and him. And speaking of Achan being stoned and a heap of stones placed over him. In verses 24 and 25 of Joshua 7, we see the words them, them, and them that are used, probably speaking of his possessions, not his children, his wife, and all that. His animals, they stoned and burned. His possessions, they were burned. And I don't think it's speaking of his family. Why? Because who they would have had heap of stones placed over them too, right? And we don't see that. So I think his family was left. It was just Achan and the animals and his possessions that they destroyed. In fact, you know, Ezekiel 18.20, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Absolutely. You, it's, it's your own sin that you're uh, being judged for. It's What's interesting, the name Achan, again, trouble, I don't know. Can you imagine naming your kid Aiken? Hey, trouble, come here. 
I mean, he kind of set you up for failure, right? I don't know. I just think that's kind of funny. But, you know, here's us. We're, we're all, we're all aching. We're all born in trouble, right? We're all born in sin. And there's nothing we can do about it but Jesus. And he's the door where we'll find forgiveness of sin. But we have to go through it. You know, Hosea talked about that. In Hosea 2.15, you know, the valley of trouble is, is for Achor, or excuse me, the valley of Achor means valley of trouble. And Hosea said in Hosea 2.15, I will give her vineyards from there in the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. Our door of hope is Jesus. It, I love that. I think that's what Jesus, that's what Hosea was talking about, a door of hope. And Paul in Galatians 5, all, and those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. You see, we have to crucify the flesh. Today we want to build up the flesh, but we have to crucify it. We want the nature of Jesus, less of me, more of him in my life. And we have to surrender to the Spirit's leading, and we'll have that victory. So, chapter 8 of Joshua, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you, and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its cattle you shall take as booty for yourselves. Lay an ambush for the city behind it. So here's the difference. This is not Joshua's plan, it's the Lord's. The Lord is doing the leading and he's the one who's going to give him the victory. You know, and for us, victory in the Christian life is not the absence of conflict. It's the presence and protection of God in the midst of conflict. The world is always against what we believe. And we see that all around the world today. I mean, just look at what's going on in Africa, in these little countries in Africa where they're wiping out Christian villages because they don't like the light and they're trying to extinguish it. And the children of Israel are learning this, man. You gotta, our victory is in the Lord. And here they get the spoils of victory. If Achan would have waited, he would have received the spoils of victory from their battle at Ai. But he jumped the gun and didn't obey God, and in the end, he lost. Don't miss out on the blessings of God by disobeying him, trying to get something that God doesn't want you to have. Verse 3, So Joshua arose and all the people of war to go up against Ai, and Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them away by night. And he commanded them, saying, Behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city, behind the city. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you be ready. Then I and all the people who are with me will approach the city and will come about when they come out against us as at, fir at the first. We shall flee before them. For they will come out after us till we have drawn them from the city. For they will say, they are fleeing before us as at the first. Therefore, we will flee before them. Then you shall rise from the ambush and seize the city. For the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. And it will be when you have taken the city that you shall set the city on fire. According to the commandment of the Lord, you shall do. See, I have commanded you. Joshua therefore sent them out and they went to lie in ambush and stayed between Bethel and Ai on the west side of Ai. But Joshua lodged that night among the people. Then Joshua rose up early in the morning and mustered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel, before the people of Ai. And all the people of war who were with him went up and drew near. And they came before the city and camped on the north side of Ai. Now there was a valley between them and Ai. So he took about 5,000 men and sent them in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the city. And when they had set the, had set the people, all the army that was on the north of the city and its rear guard on the west of the city, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley. 
So AI maybe had 12,000 people, maybe half were soldiers, fighting men, and Joshua says to send in 30,000 men. And this first group was to be used as ambush against the city of Ai. They were on the west side hiding out. The second group of soldiers, including Joshua, camped in front of the city of Ai. On the north side, why? Well, so they could be seen. They were the decoys, you might say. So the soldiers will come out after them. And the third group of soldiers, about 5,000, were used to cut off any reinforcements coming to the aid of the people of Ai. So now they're all set. Look at verse 14. Now it happened when the king of Ai saw that the men of the city hastened and rose early and went out against Israel to battle, he and all his people at an appointed place before the plain. But he did not know that, the, that there was an ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them and fled by the way of the wilderness. So all the people who were in Ai were called together to pursue them. And they pushed Josh, or pursued Joshua and were drawn away from the city. There was not a man left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. So they left the city open and pursued Israel. So when the king of Ai saw the children of Israel, he goes, you know what? We defeated this guys once. Let's all go out and get them again because these guys are nothing. But he didn't realize that there was an ambush waiting for him. Um, and Ai was defenseless. All the soldiers were gone. They left to get Joshua and all those and the guys that were with him. Verse 18. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in your hand toward Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city. So the, those in ambush arose quickly out of their place. They ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand, and they entered the city and took it and hastened to set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended to heaven. So they had no power to flee this way or that way. And the people who had fled to the wilderness turned back on the pursuers. Now when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. Then the others came out of the city against them. So they were caught in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side. And they struck them down so that they let none of them remain or escape. But the king of Ai they took alive and brought him to Joshua. And it came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field, in the wilderness where they pursued them, and when they all had fallen by the edge of the sword until they were um, consumed, that all these Israelites returned to Ai and struck it with the edge of the sword. So it was that all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai, for Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the spear until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. Only the livestock and the spoil of that city Israel took as booty for themselves, according to the word of the Lord which he had commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it a heap forever, a desolation to this day. And the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until evening, and as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his corpse down from the tree, cast it at the entrance of the gate of the city, and raise over it a great heap of stones that remains to this day. So again, this victory, was the plan was given to them by God. It was an ambush. And, you know, once these, the people of Ai left the city, again, no protection now in the city. They probably, again, thought, hey, these guys are nothing. And here they are right in front of us. Let's just wipe them out. And not realizing that there was a whole army on the other side. And they destroyed Ai. And, you know, I don't know about you, but, man, you're out in a battle and you turn around and you look at your city in flames. It's a little disheartening, you know. Now what are we going to do? And it was over for them. Now, in Joshua 8.18, God said to Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in your hand toward Ai, for I will give it into your hand. For I will give it into your hand. And Joshua, we're told in verse 26, did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the spear until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. 
Does that remind you of anything? Way back in Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 16, Joshua and the children of Israel were fighting against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went on the top of the hill overseeing the battle. And when Moses lifted up his arms, the children of Israel were winning. And they got tired and they started coming down. And then, you know, Aaron and Hur lifted up his arms, victory. And I think Joshua, just obeying the Lord, said, you know what? I need to do what God instructed me. And God gave him the victory. And I think lifting up of the hands is symbolic of intercessory prayer. Don't give up on intercessory prayer. Sometimes you need to bring brothers and sisters in, into your prayer time um, to lift these things up. You know, that's why we have the prayer request. You know, people fill them out or they email me and we send it out to the prayer warriors who lift them up. It's that important. Well, verse 30. Now Joshua built an altar to the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man has wielded any iron tool, and they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there in the presence of the children of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. So that's what Moses instructed them to do. Take some large stones, whitewash them, and write the words of the law on them. Now, you know, some say that this is only the Ten Commandments because, you know, you need a pretty big stone to write all of Deuteronomy on, right? So it can't, it, it's got to be like the Ten Commandments. Well, archaeologists discovered huge pillars um, eight feet long in the Middle East. And the Behistun inscription in Iran, they have one that's three times the length of Deuteronomy. So I don't think it was just the Ten Commandments. I think they wrote the whole law of Moses, all of it, on these stones. Now, Mount Ebal, they were to put up an altar. Mount Ebal is about 35 miles north of Jerusalem, kind of in the middle part of the land. It's an area that's known as Shechem. This is where God wanted the children of Israel to gather once they were in the land. And now they're writing his words on these large stones, setting them up on an altar for sacrifice, uh, or setting up an altar for, of sacrifice as well. Today, you know, I'll kind of give you an idea where Shechem is. Shechem today includes uh, Jericho, um, and the, it's called the West Bank. So just so you have an idea, this is what the area. And the altar was not ornate. It was just stones, and upon the altar, sacrifices would be made. Why not ornate? Because God doesn't want the children of Israel to focus on the altar, or even the one who built the altar. You know, oh, Billy Bob did a great job uh, building the altar. No. He wants them to focus upon what? The sacrifice. You know, we have ornate churches where you tend to focus on the beauty of the altar, you might say, or the picture, picturesque view uh, instead of the sacrifice. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, who's the sacrifice? Who's the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world? We're to focus on Jesus. That's the idea. And, you know, we have the burnt offering that was spoken way back in Leviticus 1, dedication. Peace offering, Leviticus 3, spoke of peace and celebration. And, you know, on Mount Ebal, this is where the cursings were spoken. What's interesting is this is the place where the altar was. Why? Because when you're in sin, you need a sacrifice. I find that fascinating. Sin separates from us from God. We need the sacrifice for our sins, the blood of Christ. So yeah, verse 33. Then all Israel, with their elders and officers and judges, stood on either side of the ark before the priest, the Levites who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the stranger as well as he who was born among them. Half of them were in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded before the before, that they should bless the people of Israel. So after this defeat at Ai that we read of back in chapter 7, 
the children of Israel repented of their sin, as we've seen here in Joshua 8, and got their, now they're going to do what God instructed them to do, what Moses told them to do. And again, 25 miles or so from Ai is Shechem. Not an easy move, right, for a few million people. I mean, it's not like you can get on a bus and, hey, you know, we need 500,000 buses. What do you got? You know, no, it's, they walked. And for Mount Gerizim, man, Mount Gerizim was lush. It was fertile. It had springs and was filled with life, with color. And this is where the blessings for obedience flowed. On the other side, with the valley in the middle, the other side the, was Mount Ebal, barren, rocky, no life on it. This is where the cursings flowed for disobedience. And again, we call them mountains, but they rose only like 3,000 feet or so in the air. And again, right in the middle was this valley. And this is where the Levites, the priests were located as six of the 12 tribes were stationed by, by Mount Gerizim and six by Mount Ebal. And the tribe of Levi was located on Mount Gerizim, but again, the priests were in the middle. You think, well, how did they hear? I mean, it's not like they had, you know, big speakers, you know. I just remember in my younger days going to concerts and, you know, the speakers were like 20 feet high, right? And yeah. what's that? Heck yeah, they were. Oh, they were, yeah. And, you know, that's why I can't hear today. But <laughs> otherwise, it didn't affect me at all. The way the mountains are, and being in this valley, it was like a natural amphitheater. And so they can hear everyone very clearly. And when the priest called out the cursings, those on Mount Ebal would shout amen. When the blessings were called from Mount Gerizim, they would shout amen. Let's look at verse, finish up looking at verses 34 and 35. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessings and the cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the congregation of Israel, with the women, the little ones, and the strangers who were living among them. So please don't complain about how long my teaching is. He read the whole book of Deuteronomy, man. That, that was going to take a while. But think about it. Why? Because God instructed Joshua that when they're in the land, this is what they were to do. Hear God's word. Why? So they could walk accordingly. It's what, when the whole book of Joshua opened up in Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, the Lord said, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate upon it day and night, that you may observe to do all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And the children of Israel needed to understand what God wanted them to do. The whole book of Deuteronomy is reminding the second generation. Moses wanted them to hear this so they are prepared once they get in the promised land. David said in Psalm 119 verses 9 through 11, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Saturate yourself with the word of God. It, God will speak to you. His spirit will show you things you're doing right, things you're doing wrong, so you can correct them. You have a decision. Do I want to go down that path or do I want to just obey the Lord and not go down that path that's going to lead to destruction. We need to let the word of God keep us clean as we read it and apply it to our lives. And again, you know, we want quick fixes, right? I, I have to admit, if I get sick or something, okay, let's get through this right away here. I'll give you a day. Yeah, it doesn't really work like that, does it? I am not a patient person, but um, yeah, my wife knows. Um, the sanctification process is not a quick fix. It's a lifelong process that ends when we go to be with the Lord. And we want quick fixes. Lord, I've had this problem for 
three days now, let's fix it. It doesn't always work like that. Now, I, I've had friends, they were delivered from smoking uh, instantaneously, and others struggled for years. Just how, I don't know. I, I can't explain it. But take in the word of God. Ask God to give you the victories that you need because you're not going to do it on your own. There's really no shortcuts. Waiting upon the Lord, renewing our strength, right? And let me close with this. If Joshua had sought the Lord before the battle of Ai, they would have been victorious like they were the first time at Jericho. They wouldn't have lost 36 men. But again, this was just a little city. It's not a big deal. You only need 3,000 men. We've got this. And they lost because they didn't seek the Lord. They were in trouble. We need to bring all things to God and allow him to speak to our hearts to guide us. Because we're going to see next week the Gibeonites. They are so good at acting that Joshua was fooled by their actions because he didn't seek the Lord. And again, two lessons, Ai and the Gibeonites. Seek the Lord, even if it seems like an easy solution, an easy answer, an easy fix. Say, Lord, is this what you really want me to do? Is this really, you know, I, I had someone again call me that needed money. And I know this guy because I helped him before and he deceived me before. And I caught him in it, but I still helped him out. But this time I wasn't. I, and he said, I've been working for four weeks at this new job and I don't get paid until next week. And can you help me? If I don't pay the rent, my son and I are going to get kicked out of our apartment. This was the same story I heard last time. I said, so what were you doing before? What kind of work were you doing before if you've only been at this job four weeks? Oh, I, I got let go because I wasn't going to work. Okay, well, that, that's a big red flag. Um, and then I said, okay, so you've been working four weeks, so you've already got paid at least once if you get paid every two weeks. So why don't you have the money for the rent? Oh, no, I've only been working two weeks. All right, thank you. okay. And I told him flat out, I said, I'm sorry, I don't trust you. And then he gave the Christian, you know, you're a Christian. And, and I'm like, I'm sorry. You told me four weeks. We have to be wise. You know, I want to help as many people as I can. But we have, this is God's money, and I don't want to enable someone to continue in bad behavior. And, you know, for Joshua, wow, it's a fascinating story with the Gibeonites, and we'll see that next time. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for your word. You know, if man wrote this book, it, all the stories would be great and they'd all be victorious and everything would be great. But you tell it like it is. You give us the good, bad, and the ugly. And tonight we saw some of the bad and ugly, but we also saw the good. And Lord, your desire is always for us to follow you, to be obedient to what you want us to do. Help us to be sensitive to your Spirit's leading and to walk by faith and not by sight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.